Buenos dias, bon dia, and good morning to everybody. Um, happy New Year to everybody. Tom, how do you say good morning? Nakichua? How do you say? Ohio, Ohio gozaimas. Ohio gozaimas. Okay, so I got Japanese covered. So, uh, <laughs> one, it's great to be on with Tom and Paul, as you said. I've known Tom all the way back, almost to high school. Um, and it's great to be on with you. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about futsal, you know. So, uh, futsal has been great because of what Tom's mission is, is soccer starts at home. And if you think about younger players, two, three, four, manipulating a ball, and then as they get to seven, eight, nine, ten, they take those techniques and methodology and bring it into a futsal court. I, I think if you take Tom's methodology and what futsal can do, I think you start creating great outdoor players. And, and I, that's the conversation uh, that goes today. So, Paul, I'm honored to be on. Thank you, Keith. All right. So um, I guess, you know, for me, you know, I, I know I played a lot of futsal growing up um, or as a coach, as an early coach, but I knew nothing about futsal. I didn't really know about um, the tactics of it. Okay. We basically got onto a court and started playing. And all I knew was this is, has to be incredible for the players, right? The speed of play, the technique, the tight spaces, all that stuff. But I knew nothing about the tactics. Um, so I, 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 I'm hoping that you can touch base a little bit on what that's all about. And, and then also what I would, I know personally, what I'd be really interested in and, and, and what I'll probably be asking about is how do we, how do we keep building a futsal culture in greater Houston, in our area where we play more than just, you know, in the winter time, right? A couple months a year, a month, a half and a year. How do we do it so we can build it into, you know, the, the, the year long, way of training and developing players? I'll, I'll tell you two quick stories. I'll tell you one from Europe and I'll tell you one from the United States. Several years ago when Spain was the world champion in outdoor football, I was at La Rosa uh, in Madrid, which is the Spanish football complex. And Angel was the president of the Spanish Federation at that time. And he told all of us national team coaches and FIFA instructors, hey, when you get the opportunity this week, I want you to go over to our museum and hopefully get your picture taken, the World Cup trophy. And he said, one of the big reasons why we are the World Cup champion right now is many years ago, we decided that football would be part of our youth player development here in Spain. And you know, all of us futsal people got very excited about that because obviously we're on this mission of, of getting more people involved in futsal. And then I had a Brazilian guy sitting next to me and he goes, yeah, the other reason why they took futsal is because they were so sick of us beating them all the time. So that was like a big shot in the arm. Spring forward and come to the United States, and we all know about the success of Anson Dorrance in, in North Carolina winning over 20 national championships and creating players like, you know, Kristen Lilly and Mia Hamm. Uh, I went down to visit uh, Anson two years ago, and Tom helped uh, get that, that relationship started. And, and when I'm sitting in his, in his kitchen having a cup of coffee, because what he did was he brought futsal in as part of his – uh, identification process at, at North Carolina. And, and he was telling me that he thinks that, that futsal is the game changer. And then I said, coach, can I tell you something? And he said, what? I go, you've won so many championships and you still are trying to find an edge, how to stay one step ahead of everybody else. And that you, you believe that futsal is the game changer. And we had this long conversation. So this past, I don't know if all of you went to the coaching uh, USC coaches convention in Baltimore last year, but Anson and I did the first ever futsal soccer uh, session uh, together, futsal meets soccer. And I asked all the coaches, I said, not to be disrespectful, but if you, if this guy's won all these championships and he believes in futsal and he has it in his program, how many championships have you all won and why don't you believe in the sport? Oh my God, the conversation after that session was great because so many people came and said, oh my God, how do we get involved and so forth and so on. So um, futsal has become a bigger, bigger part of it. And I'm extremely excited that, that Houston Dynamo got in contact with Tom and that you're all involved in the youth process from the two-year-olds 
all the way up and through futsal and then of course to your outdoor team. So two quick stories. So tell me, Paul, why don't we do this? Why don't we first open it up for the first five or 10 minutes just for questions. And then if they want to see some methodology, I put together a PowerPoint presentation uh, on defense uh, because I, I love scoring goals, but I also love defending. And a lot of the guys that came from indoor soccer uh, that are now coaching in major league soccer, and there's a lot of them, they all said that we wish that players played at least one year of indoor or futsal to become better defensive players. So, Paul, if you don't mind, if we just open it up for questions first, and then we can go to the PowerPoint if the coaches want to see it. Absolutely. All right. Does anybody want to lead us off with any questions? I see some. What's cool is I see some people that are um, real big futsal um, fans and and proponents of the game. So I see Harold Z Zarita on there. Yes. Um, Morning. How's everybody doing? Hey, Harold, who's got a futsal center down in the southwest of Houston. Um, but no, any, any questions out there, guys, guys and girls? Yeah, I've got a quick question, Keith. With the um, – obviously, sometimes the, the limitation with the, with the futsal is the facilities. Have you, have you, seen, have you seen it replicated um, in an outdoor venue? Or is, there, or is there a good way to kind of replicate what you get from futsal um, outside? Yeah, let me just step away for one second. Let me grab something so I can show you. When I, when I travel the country or the world teaching, I respectfully say this, that the United States has more futsal courts than any other country in the world because every elementary, junior high, high school, college, church, they all have gyms, but not one gym. I mean, I've been to some schools that have four to six gyms. But then we have unused or not used tennis courts all over our country. So if you can see this, these are futsal courts that I built in Milwaukee that were four tennis courts, not used. I went to the city, I did a, uh, a business plan and now turned four tennis courts into two lighted futsal courts outdoors. And I know that you guys are doing this in Houston. There are so many parking lots. I mean, it's funny, I drive down the street and I'll see like an empty parking lot and I got this idea of, oh, I couldn't do a futsal tournament in this parking lot, right? Because we, we take our youth national teams, uh, uh, we just came back from Buenos Aires uh, about a year ago, and there's futsal courts underneath the expressways and the cement. And when the parents saw this, they first kind of shook their head like, oh, my kid's gonna play in cement? You know, an hour later, they're like, oh my God, this is fantastic. So to answer your question, Randy, and it's a great question. When you drive around, there are strip malls that are empty and have been empty for a long period of time. So if you go to some buildings and you could get to the guy who owns them and say, look it, can, can I co-rent this place for you for certain months or tennis courts or basketball courts or, um, there's a lot of facilities around the country that I think we can turn into futsal courts and hopefully we'll do that. Great question, man. Hey, Keith, uh, Harold here. Awesome talking to you. Um, just to touch base on what you're talking about. So in South America, uh, Brazil, Bolivia, Argentina, Chile, Peru, et cetera, it's, it's strictly most of the courts that they have for futsal is concrete, you know, and they just throw a roof on top of it, some stands and they're golden. And that's yep. where the grassroots training begins. Yep. That's, and, and I think with Randy, I think we came to the Sugarland once and uh, we were passing by, I believe it was like a rec center in one of these neighborhoods. And we saw these tennis courts. Remember Randy, you're like, Hey, that would be perfect for futsal, you know, right? Cause it's empty. Nobody's using them. And it, it's just, uh, it's a shame that we don't take advantage of, of these situations that we have and we take for granted what we don't use. And it just, it, you're absolutely right when you say there's more courts or more availability here in the U.S. than there are in other countries. It's, it's incredible, incredible. Actually, one of the laws of the game in futsal was changed that you can tackle. And I, and I was like, well, why would they change that? Well, I, I talked to FIFA and they said that they wanted the rule books from outdoor and futsal to be similar. 
Mm-hmm. But if you, if you know people that are play futsal, there's not a lot of sliding tackles. I mean, on the national team level and professional, yeah. But on the youth level, it, it forces kids to learn how to defend by themselves, learn how to defend with their minds, instead of learning how to defend just through the physicality of, of the game. So you don't have a, a lot of sliding tackles. So the concrete, and I always tell the players, by the way, it's soft concrete. So don't be scared, okay, mm-hmm. um, which, which is wonderful. But here, here's what I did in Milwaukee. I drove by these tennis courts on a Monday, let's say, and I noticed no one was on the courts. Then Wednesday and Friday, I drove past, no one on. So what I did is I put an Excel sheet together. And remember, politicians are all about stats. So I took stats for about five months, dates, times, and how many people were on the court. And there was never everybody on the court. So I finally went to the city government with my business plan, told them about what futsal is, what it can provide to the inner city, how it can save lives and also you know, create another sport for them. And then they looked at the stats and they said, hey, Charlie, hey, Tom, hey, Frank, do you know no one's using tennis courts out in Lincoln Park? No, I didn't know that. And actually, there was a program in Milwaukee that they put up half the money to build those courts. So if you have a facility that you think same thing can happen, that's a good step forward to go there. Good question. Great question, Harold. Anybody else? I got a question. Yep. Um, what does futsal look like in, in these other countries? You kind of alluded to it a little bit, but like where, how's futsal and the youth in, in, in Europe or in South America? How much has it played in Japan, Tom, maybe? But what's the difference between these other countries that are really using it well and, and, and the U.S.? Yeah. Uh, Tom, I'll let you jump in with Japan. I'll, I'll talk about Brazil first. Yep. All young players. And remember, futsal is street soccer. That's, you know, it wasn't called futsal. It was, it was like in the old days where you had pickup games. So all of a sudden, three, six kids got together and played 3v3 in the street. And it's like, hey, Harold, there's a car coming. Wait, okay. So we get out of the street and the car goes by and we play. Um, then someone put a name to it, right? The futsal. So young players in Brazil, they go and play futsal. And they play in the schools. So instead of doing kickball in the United States, they're playing futsal. And let me tell you, the players are are unbelievable. The physicality, the mental, the the technical ability. So all the kids play futsal from, you know, four, five, six, seven, all the way to about 11 or 12. Then all of a sudden you get the Flamingo or you get Santos. They all look for players uh, in futsal. And then they come outdoor. Neymar, by the way, his first game in the United States at Giants Stadium years ago, um, they beat the U.S. 3-0. And it was him and four other guys. There was, you know, basically there were 17-year-old kids coming from futsal to to play for Brazil to beat the United States. Um, So futsal in in Brazil, Argentina, all that, it's perpendicular. They cross over. In Spain, it's a little becoming a little bit more parallel that the kids definitely play futsal. But some kids at that age either go futsal or go football. It's not so much of the crossover. Uh, in Iran, who's got wonderful futsal, okay? Uh, their players also, same thing like Brazil. Uh, in Portugal, Benefica and Sporting, I, I was with them a year or two ago. They bring futsal into their program. Um, and Asia has become rather big. And I think, I think Tom can talk more about what's happening in Japan and the AFC. Yeah, in Japan, futsal is, is enormously popular. Uh, we have literally thousands of facilities everywhere. Um, like Keith was saying, like he was driving by, and whenever, wherever I go in Japan, when I see any open space, immediately I think about a, a building a futsal facility there. We have them everywhere. We've got them on the tops of roof parking, uh, roof, rooftops of department stores. We've got them under train tracks. We've got them everywhere that you might think it's what's considered dead space. We've built futsal courts there. So literally we have thousands of them. We also have a full-time professional league called the F League, Futsal League, extremely popular here in Japan. 
We also have an under 12 national tournament. It's very prestigious to play in. And that is made up of kids that play both. They'll play outside outdoor uh, soccer, football, and they'll also compete for the, uh, for the, uh, for the indoor tournament um, as well. Our national team here in Japan is very strong. Um, goes regularly to the uh, FIFA Futsal World Cup uh, tournament. Um, we've had some of the best players in the world uh, come and actually play here in Japan as well. Um, so it's a very, very big, and, and like Keith was saying, in AFC here, which is our confederation, the Asian Football Confederation, where we have 47 member associations, um, football's a big priority. Uh, futsal is a big priority here in AFC. And all of those tiger countries down in Southeast Asia, Thailand, Vietnam, Vietnam Malaysia, uh, Singapore, uh, Indonesia, they're huge, huge futsal countries. So it's, uh, it's very, very, very important, um, at, at, especially at the federation level. Um, it's a priority sport um, in, in, in all of the AFC countries here. And that's kind of, you know, a little bit of, uh, of what the challenge is sometimes is getting these countries to really position it and give it the status that it really truly needs. Um, so I, 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 th I think that's, that's important. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's so many facilities in the United States that could be converted to futsal facilities. And I know Paul, at least in Houston, we talk about it a lot because we are, we are heavily involved into the school systems now. There's 17 school districts in the Houston area and we're in several of the main largest ones, um, but we've already started, Paul's already started trying to formulate a strategy um, for converting or at least convincing schools um, to potentially place futsal programs with inside the schools. So with that, I'll yield my time and someone else can jump in if they'd like. Hey, Tom, Harold here again, and you're absolutely right about uh, Asia and Japan. I was in Japan, I went to 1996 with uh, uh, Marinos when Dunga was playing there, and uh, my cousin uh, Julio Cesar Valdivieso. So and you're absolutely, they actually inaugurated then some futsal courts, which was amazing, and it's just, it's, the way Japan has grown in soccer and futsal, it's amazing. I just wish we could do that here. Absolutely amazing, amazing. And they, this is, you know, 20 years ago. <laughs> so they're way ahead and we're, you know, kind of behind on that, on the pitch. Well, Here's another story that's happening. In 2007, the Solomon Islands FA got together and said, hey, are we going to really do something in the World Cup on outdoor? Or could we do something with futsal? And can we save young people's lives? So in 2007, they got 24 young people together. They trained. They qualified for the World Cup in 2008 in Rio de Janeiro. They lost one game, I think, 22 to 0 against Brazil. Four years later, I'm going to really quick go through the story. Four years later, they qualified again. They actually won a game in 2012. And in 16 and 20, they are Oceanus champion. Wow. But not only are they champion, but now they've set up centers in Solomon Islands for futsal in all the schools. Not only were they champions and saved young people, but some of those players went on to sign outdoor in England and other parts of Europe as football players. Well, what happened with that is it started a wave. And that wave was the other islands close to them and also Australia and New Zealand, they all said, hey, we, we could do this. Now you got Trinidad, Tobago, you got Jamaica now getting involved in it, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Panama already, already has big programs. So it's, it's, it's a big thing coming. And again, Paul, congratulations to you bringing Tom on and all your coaches there that are gonna bring futsal to your players. Any other uh, comments or questions? Yeah, I got one. Okay, Everett. Yeah, so um, what, what, my, what surprised me is when I moved to Houston is that um, a, a certain clubs call their futsal program where they play 4v4, 5v5, but they play it on turf. Like they don't play it on, 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 on actually futsal 
uh, ground or on concrete because you can go to the parking lot and you can play futsal, right? But they, they, they played on turf where you have other facilities that call futsal facilities, but they played on turf. I'm like, that's different. With a size five ball. <laughs> I'm sorry? Yeah. With a size five ball, Eric, right? <laughs> yeah, with a size five ball, it bounces up. It's, it, I'm like, this, or they play with, with, with walls. I'm like, that's not real futsal, right? That's no, not, not real, not the real thing. And, but clubs teach their parents, their, 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 their children, this is futsal. I'm like, no, that's not futsal. Real futsal gets played differently. You got diff different technique for that. And that just really surprised me in, in such a big city as Houston that some clubs just either don't want to or uh, they, they, I don't, I, they just don't really want to invest in it, and which yeah. they should. Everett, that's, that's a great point, by the way. There, there are people around the country that say they're futsal people, but they're just speed and agility coaches. And they say that they're futsal. They're, they're not futsal. They're, no. they're speed and agility coaches. Um, Kids that are playing on, on turf, if that's the only thing they have, okay, that's great, what you have, okay? But if we can get the size four or five, the size four ball or three for the younger players and, and on wood or concrete or whatever where the game is supposed to be played, it, it definitely changes the game. But if they don't have it for the time being, you got to do it. Everett, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Where are you originally from? The Netherlands. That's what, well, the colors, right? So, <laughs> right? Yeah, you yeah. know, in, in Holland and Sweden and Finland, futsal is becoming huge. By the way, the first MVP of the first World Cup in futsal comes from, from Holland, by the way. Um, uh, so in that part of the world, it, it's really becoming very popular. Yeah, it's, in, our, in our country, it's when – when uh, the season ends, everybody goes indoors. Literally every, every amateur club, they, they work together with the schools and you play for, uh, from I would say December till January, you play futsal, you train two times a week and there's, there's leagues. Yeah. And everybody does, it doesn't matter if you play for the top club or you play for a local amateur club, everybody plays futsal. Yeah, and, and Eric, this is a conversation Paul and I had and Harold, you'll know this too is that the clubs that utilize futsal in Europe, in Asia, in South America, in Central America, it's not a wintertime sport. No, it's a year. The, the, the U8s might be on a futsal court on Monday, and the U10s might be in on Tuesday in the 12s and the 14s and the 16s. So they actually have futsal in their youth development all year long. Yeah, actually. And, and, and by the way, the new rules for the goalkeeper. I mean, for years I've been saying in futsal, that you should be able to play the ball to a teammate inside the penalty area. And, and now obviously it's outdoor soccer brought and now it's in futsal. But now the goalkeeper is, is the first player on attack a lot, not only with his hands now, but also his feet. And that's what futsal can, can develop. The split save the, uh, is becoming big in outdoor, which comes from futsal. So there are so many overlaps now between the two games. Uh, it's quite exciting. Especially for goalkeepers, like you said, their reaction time, the speed of the ball, the speed of play, using their legs, their feet to, to control, to play, pulling out. They could actually score now. It's, uh, it's amazing, amazing. So, um, you know, with, with, with Tom and with Soccer Starts at Home, you know, we're really, really trying to, to share the philosophy of soccer leaders educating the parents within their clubs about that need to to work with their child or that that the joy and the benefits of working with your child in the home even at two three four five and all those benefits of the ball mastery right the control of the ball and you see a lot of the the key ball mastery skills are are learning to control the ball with the sole of your foot right to pull it back to control it to start to stop right so it seems like it would be such an amazing progression of development as these kids are beginning to do this at home and that culture is being built in the home. And then really the first things or one of the first things they do in their development program is a program where they have to utilize that control and they have to develop that control. So, I mean, I see it, you know, um, you know, I'll tell one really, really quick story. I went to Brazil way back in, I think it was, you know, 2000. 
and I went to the GM futsal center in, um, and it was unbelievable. It was owned by General Motors. It was for their, their employees, in fact, right? Um, where was it? It was in Sao Paulo. And the kids were actually playing futsal like at midnight on, on a Friday night with the barbecue going on and they were playing futsal. And that was the first time I saw 10 year olds, 11 year olds. I mean, the, the American kid that I brought down there with his family and his dad, the kid was actually crying a little bit because the ball was moving so fast. This was a good player in American, right? But the ball was moving so fast that he couldn't get it. He almost teared up. But these were kind of all really regular, normal kids in Brazil at 10, 11, and they were all playing futsal. So, and, and more, go, go ahead. Hey, good, good morning, guys. Um, Paul, thanks for having this. And uh, I wanted to say, this is more of a comment, but I'm um, a big fan of, of Coach Tozer. I was able to actually be on a futsal trip with him uh, in Portugal a couple years ago, and also big fan of Tom and soccer starts at home. But um, we, I have a grassroots futsal academy in Minneapolis, Minnesota, TC Soul, and we work with a lot of um, uh, uh, communities that are have, have have been somewhat like uh, ignored, we say, by the the mainstream soccer circle. So so a lot of times we hear about academies and soccer clubs using futsal, but what I've noticed here recently is that we've got a tremendous response from inner city kids, especially like the African American community, kids who who are not, who haven't had access or who are not exposed to, to, to soccer even. It seems like with futsal, just the five on five, fast pace, we have a lot of basketball players in there. So it's also a great game to get the young kids going who, who aren't exposed to soccer or futsal. So I just wanted to add that, that piece as well. Thanks again. First of all, I got to congratulate you for what you guys are doing up in Minnesota, because I don't know if you guys know, but this program was started two or three years ago and would just, 12 kids or whatever. How many kids do you have now involved in your academies? Oh, uh, we're, we're at about uh, maybe uh, about 80 kids now. 80 kids in a, in a short period of time. So that, that's wonderful. You know, I, I was a hockey player growing up in, in New York. So when I got into indoor soccer in the major indoor soccer league, I felt comfortable on an indoor soccer field, even though it wasn't ice, it was turf. But the boards, the glass, how it was set up, similar rules. So I felt comfortable in that. It, you know, when U.S. Soccer Foundation years ago, after I think the 94, 96 World Championship here in the United States, uh, they said that they were going to build a bunch of outdoor fields in the inner city and get kids to play soccer. Well, what they found out was that you can't find a lot of space. And if you could find space, it was too expensive. But then you're not going to get 20 some odd kids to come to an outdoor field. And, and who's going to keep and cut the grass and doing everything? Just think of the impact that we have with the young kids in the inner city across their country with gymnasiums. I, I say that if U.S. soccer would put more money into small sided games and futsal, into the inner city, coaching education, that's great. Player development, unbelievable. But if you could put money, millions of dollars, in the programs that they're doing in Minnesota similar to that, you would see such a fast progression of creating players. I'll tell you a quick story. Otto Orff, former national team player, 96 World Cup MVP as a goalie. He built a futsal court in the inner city of Akron on top of a piece of slab of concrete. And he invited me to go there and he said, coach, you've got a grand opening. And all these kids played and they never saw a soccer before a ball in their life, futsal ball. And after two or three hours, I turned to Otto and I go, oh my God. I go, you got to keep an eye on her and you got to keep an eye on him and you got to keep an eye on her and you got to keep an eye on him. I mean, it's amazing. And, but the most important thing, it gets kids, Mario, like you're doing up in Minnesota, it gives them another avenue to create special things in their life. That's what I love about it. Can I ask Mario a quick question? Absolutely. Yes. Mario, what, what venues do you use for, uh, for your futsal? Well, um, we use, as you know, Minnesota is a pretty, uh, it's a pretty cold place. So, so the foots, the indoor, quote unquote, the indoor time to be on the ball is, is greater, is longer than most, um, most other cities. So in the past, we've used gyms, um, ele uh, elementary, middle school gyms um, in the community. But, but um, 
we're working on, we also do uh, free clinics every month. And in, this, in a couple months when we can get outside, we have those on, as coach said, uh, basketball courts, tennis courts, and parking lots. So we plan on having, a, we have a big idea for this summer and all of this will be done on um, basketball courts and tennis courts. By the way, Bonet, and I, Mark's a friend of mine who owns Bonet. Bonet has a pair of futsal goals that are really good portable. They come in a bag. You, like Mario says, all of a sudden, hey, I find a parking lot. Hey, guys, let's go play futsal. Pop them up. You know what they do in Canada, right? The kids put their stick in their backpack and their shovel in their backpack. They go to a golf course. They find a pond. They shovel it off, and they play hockey on, on ice that's like this. And we want to know why Canadians are such great hockey players. Well, same thing in futsal. Throw those goals in your car. Go find a parking lot. Go play futsal. Bare feet. <laughs> Paul, I have a question. Yes, Adriano. Uh, so I'm 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 really interested in um, uh, converting. Uh, tennis courts and uh, basketball courts into futsal courts. We actually have a, a conversation, a conversation going with the uh, city of College Station and Brian, that started last year. I guess that we need to put some some more facts into the uh, into the plan and uh, show them that uh, you know these this, this courts are really not used at all. Uh, so we can speed up the process because, as we know, you know, like everywhere else in the world, uh, politicians. Uh, can be can be really really slow in making decisions, uh, so we have that going on. The next question, the question I have is, once we have um, so the, the the facilities that you that you guys have in Milwaukee or or you know some others in the, in, in the in the audience here can answer that too. Are they open 24/7 and they don't have to pay? Kids don't have to pay to to access it, um, or is there a price to get in? Um, and uh, uh, the, the, sec the second thing is that uh, how would you, in again, I guess that, that uh, somebody else asked this question, but I would like more details on that. How would you incorporate your, fo your futsal training um, into the life of a kid that trains three, four nights a week and plays two games per weekend? Uh, so do you think that futsal should be one night out of these three and we out of these three nights and we take away the regular soccer practice or or is it something that we add on to the to the regular practice because uh you know the risk of that is that to me at least uh in a country like this where we have we still have to be to build the culture which is uh which is the main thing for me um the risk is that the kids get get burned out and you know when they're 13 14 they're they, they have they've had too much of soccer futsal and everything else and you know they, they're gonna do they're gonna do something else they're gonna quit so my my that's my that's my concern there so this these two questions if you can answer thank you yeah let me answer the first one the courts that we have in milwaukee and it's similar to a lot of courts around the country yes they're open for free play there's a phone number and a website that if someone goes up they can call it and we'll give them the code and how to get into it there's also paid programming on there. Uh, we have a futsal academy here in Milwaukee. Uh, so there's leagues or tournaments or academy, uh, but there's big hours on the court that's open there. Th the reason why we don't keep them open all the time, uh, Adriano, is because of vandalism, unfortunately. Uh, there are some courts that people, uh, they put up and then kids ride their bicycles on them or paint them or damage the fence so forth and so on. So actually we put up, uh, cameras so that we can watch the facility uh, when we're not there. Let me ask you a question before I answer your second question. What age group are you talking about? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm from Italy, so futsal, we play 2 to 35, you know, <laughs> pretty much whenever we have a chance. So to me, it should be part, it should be part of the training and it should be part of, because it's part of the culture. So, you, so uh, when you say that futsal and, and, and soccer are really crossing over, I mean, I really see the point. I see what's happening in my country. There's not really much difference between the two. You know, you play, you play one and the other as, as many times as you can. Yeah. Um, but, 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 I mean, I think that here I'm talking about, uh, you know, maybe kids that are 3 to 12. Oh, so 
that's really important, that question, okay? Because it's amazing when you see a 14, 15, and 16-year-old youth player go to a futsal court for the first time. It's like a 14, 15, or 16-year-old swing a golf club for the first time. Have you ever seen someone that age swing a golf club for the first time? It is ugly. Have you ever seen a five, six, seven-year-old like Tiger Woods kid swing a golf club for the first time? It's fluid, okay? So the younger kids, they love to play. And, and futsal teaches the game through osmosis. And, and that's really what the big teacher of the game is, really the game itself before coaches come involved in it. Those, those kids in Akron, speed and agility they had, when the ball is running way in front of them, and they have to go catch it before it goes out of bounds. Do you know what part of the foot they have to use in order to stop it before it goes out of bounds? Does anybody know? What outside, inside, or sole? What part of the foot do you think? Sole. 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 So all of a sudden, you got these kids doing the technique of sole, but think about it. A kid's running as fast as he can. The ball is going to go out of bounds. Once he puts his soul on, his, uh, the, on the ball, he overruns the ball, but he turns and faces up. Isn't that the kind of players that we want in our country, is to turn and face up? And people say, soul of the foot in outdoor. Oh, come on, it's being there. If you look at Marcelo, Real Madrid, right, uh, Brazil national team, he does the scoop pass all the time to beat lines of defense or defenders. Well, because the nature of the court is small, the young kids learn how to scoop the ball over feet and over the lines of defense, and you don't have to teach that. So for me, if I have a U18, which my daughter's U10, now U11, I take one day a week and we just go to the futsal court, and you know what we do? We play. Every once in a while, I might stop and give some methodology, ask questions, which is the best way to teach, and just let them play, and, and they love it. They, they're they like, that's part of my program, and, and a move. So and you're not, however you fit it into your program, it might just be, half your session, you're just going to play futsal. Or you might say, you know, the first 10 minute warm up, we're going to emphasize scoop passing in your warm up. And let's see if we can bring it into this training session and bring it into the game. And then you go back outdoor again. And let me tell you, scoop passing in outdoor, everybody's doing it. And Keith, if I, I get just really excited, don't you? <laughs> Keith, if, if Thank I you. just make Thank one you. question that he was talking about, because there's a big question, or there's a big discussion in our sport about burnout with kids. But what they don't realize that is burnout isn't coming from playing too much, especially if it's self-chosen, right? And they're motivated to, uh, to enjoy the activity and it's conducted in a, in a free state of an environment. The burnout comes from the expectations, the pressure and the structure from the formal competition. So that's why in South America, kids that do play out in the streets, they don't get burnt out. You know, a kid can go out and play in a Brazilian outside the favela or inside the favela there, and they can play for six, seven hours, and nobody talks about burnout, nobody talks about specialization. But as soon as you start adding words like coaches, competition, pressure, training, that's when you get the burnout. So a lot of people think that they get burnt out from just playing too much. No, you don't get burnt out if it's self-chosen. And the kid and the child, basically, you develop that free will where a child believes they own their own free time and they own their own fun. There's no burnout. That's a big misconception by many people, confusing about why kids quit and why they get burnt out. A lot of kids wind up quitting because they've never mastered the sheer basics. And what happens is, from the very, very young ages, Kids will run around, a six, a seven, eight-year-old, and he'll run around or she'll run around in a game and not even touch the ball. And then they'll come off and they'll give you a high five. Or you ask the mothers and fathers, did you have fun? And they did. Well, then self-awareness self starts kicking in at the little bit of the older ages where a kid realizes they're not that good. And they realize it's more of a commitment. That's where the burnout comes or when the kid isn't enjoying and having fun. But I just wanted to kind of jump in there because it's a really hotly debated topic about burnout. Um, of kids, but again, you know, you don't see kids out in, in, in these Latin countries that are playing on hours on end, uh, they quit. In fact, they love the game because the reason is, is that in South America and in these Latin countries, kids don't fall in love with football or futsal. They fall in love with the ball first. 
They fall in love with the ball first, and then that leads to falling in love with futsal and playing football. There's a big, big difference in that. Hey, Paul, I got to ask you a favor. Yes. You recorded this. Can you clip that minute and a half of what Tom just said? Because what Tom just said is powerful. Adriano, is there any kids burning out in Italy playing in the streets? Uh, no, but, um, you know, things are changing uh, in a way that kids are less and less left alone playing in the streets because, you know, parents, are, I think they're, they're afraid of, I don't know, I don't even know what. You know, and uh, kids are more and more busy, not just with soccer, but with other things. I mean, just think about the kids here. They, they, they get out of school at 4 p.m. and then they have activities, um, you know, planned out during the week, which is parent driven. And it's not that the kids is basically making, um, you know, many of the decisions. Every, every activities, including soccer, most of the time it's parent driven. I mean, I'm walking around now. Uh, a huge park, right? And it's a beautiful day in Texas, uh, 65 degrees. If this place was in Italy, it would, I, I would see probably 150 kids playing in this park. There is nobody here, you know? And, that's, uh, and that, that tells, and it's every day like that. You know, that tells me that uh, um, kids are not, are not really left doing what they like to do and what the, and they're not free to express what they want to do. Uh, most of the time, it's the parents that are that are um, making the decisions for them. And I totally agree with Tom in this. Uh, you know, when the kids are left alone to make their decisions and to and to express themselves and to be with, you know, to be to do what they like to do. Yes, they develop the love for the sport, and it, it never goes away. Uh, but when it's somebody else making the decision for them, at some point, that you know, that will pay the price. Great point, Andrea. That's, that's awesome. Um, I have a, so Saturdays here between 5 and 8 p.m., I have a program called Futsal Matinee. It's strictly for, for youth. We get about 30 kids that come in between 5 and 8, and it's nonstop. There's no coaching. We'll just have somebody, you know, standing on the sideline, making sure that kids aren't being rough, that the laws of the game are being played. Uh, one goal in, next team goes out, one goal, it's open play style, no coaching. And these kids play for three hours nonstop. Parents are just talking, taking videos, pictures. It, the, the burnout, like you said, there is no burnout when they do it on their own and they love the game. When, when parents don't get involved or sometimes parents actually tell the kid, hey, you know what, you're going to burn out. Then all of a sudden the kid's thinking, I'm going to burn out, I'm going to burn out. And if that's in his head, eventually it'll, you know, it'll happen. But it's, it's amazing. Three hours nonstop. They're just playing and playing, playing, playing. And eight o'clock comes up when, you know, we have to shut down and switch to our next program. Oh, we're done. It, it's already eight o'clock. You know, it's, it's amazing. They just want to go on and continuously play and play. Any other questions? Oh, you want to take a quick look at the PowerPoint? Let's do it. Let's do it. And I'm sure, I'm sure there'll be some questions from that too. And... Okay. I put, can, I put I... together a presentation at the 30,000 foot view. So anytime during, if you just got a question, we'll kind of go through it. Um, so let me share my screen. Can everybody see it? Yep. So, so Harold, I think you'll like this. I threw futsal in there. So partners in futsal development. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So some of my titles. Um, by the way, I'll tell you a quick story before I go into it. I've been in indoor soccer pretty much my entire adult life. And when I got to Milwaukee, 1992, we had some great teams. But we could never get to the deep into the playoffs. Great regular season, just couldn't get there. Well, I was a captain of the team in, in the 80s. I became the head coach of the, the uh, men's national team in 1996. Then I started traveling the world. And, you know, at the coaches' convention, there's no futsal education. It's all outdoor. Right? Like I said, last in Baltimore was really the first time. 
So when I would travel to Brazil or Portugal or Spain or Singapore or whatever, I would say to the coach, hey, coach from Brazil, can I have lunch with you? Can I have dinner with you? Can, and, and why do you do this? And wh why do you do diagonal runs? Why do you do split walls? Why do you do rotation? Why is your system? So when I came back to indoor after that trip, my mind was full of all this stuff that I wanted to change indoor soccer. So I was the head coach of the national team for 20 years. In 96, four years later, we won our first championship. We went on to go to the finals nine times and went out of six of them. And we built a system that was basically a hybrid system between indoor soccer and futsal. Side of time. Uh, what's the connection of outdoor soccer and, and futsal? Well, we know in outdoor soccer that if you had to rate the percentage of goals, it's set pieces, counterattacks, and run a play. And in futsal, it's a similar, but a little bit. Number one way to score goals in futsal is counterattacks and set pieces, and then run and play as the third. So it would be logical to think that if you could practice counterattacks and set pieces at a much higher level and more quantity to create quality, that when you get back to the outdoor game, then you would have that. So these two kind of overlap between the two games. English football, World Cup in 2018, their, their coaches came over here, they studied the NBA, they studied the NFL, how to do set pieces, exploit defense, exploit defenders. But in Russia, 70% of the, 42% uh, of the goals that were scored in the World Cup were from set pieces. How many set pieces do you have in futsal? I like a lot of them because of the nature of the game. So if kids have the technical ability to execute set pieces, they have the tactical awareness, and they do 20 to 25 of those per training session, when they get outdoor, then it translates. I, I'm not going to show you the counterattack video, but counterattacks, how to create numbers. And I'll just throw Brazil out there. What a, one thing I love about Brazil football, um, let me move on so it doesn't play. What I love about Brazil futsal, uh, football is that when they win the ball, depending on what part of the field they are in outdoor soccer, they either know they're in a possession mode or a counterattack mode. American players, youth players, in my opinion, so many of them are always in a counterattack mode. They win the ball, they want to go forward, it goes out of bounds. They win the ball, they want to go forward, they go out of bounds. What I love about futsal, and it teaches how to create numerical advantages, especially in what part of the court you're on, if you have numbers up, and how to beat lines of defense. This I took from the EPL. Um, this is 2009, really it's the current, is where our goals scored from. And obviously if you look at it, ones, twos, threes, fours, and fives, or most of the goals are scored. Well, the same thing in futsal. You know, the, the half court, the court is uh, 200, uh, excuse me, is 125 feet long. So half court is almost the top of the 18 yard box. So if kids are shooting more and feel more comfortable in one, two, three, fours, and fives in a futsal court, when they go back outdoor, they become more prolific. So defensive responsibilities. And this is what I said before. If a young player doesn't know how to defend by themselves, and as I travel the country, I find so many outdoor player kids that don't know how to defend. The physicality, they stand straight up. You know, in basketball, that's like the big no-no. Don't lock your knees. Get low center of gravity. How to shape your run. Do di directional defending. Um, and when a young player learns how to defend by themselves, then they can learn with another teammate, which is cover. Turo, cover. Uh, so one presses and one covers. Well, if you got four players on a court that know how to defend, then that translates back to the outdoor game. So defensive rotations. Um, young players learn, have to learn how to defend a 1v1. <laughs> it's funny. I used to say that eight out of 10 Americans are right-sided players. Now I'd say it's nine out of 10 players, right-sided players. So such a basic thing is when you tell a youth player, by the way, we're playing Minnesota this weekend, they're all right-sided players. So we're gonna do directional defending to close down every player's right side, to force them to their left foot. 
you all know that men seven and nine are left footed and we do the other way. But kids approach the ball in this country, they don't even think about that concept. Well, if I'm just running at a player, what kind of defenders we have? So um, how to defend 2v2s and 3v2s and numbers up. They have to learn when, where, and how to double team. And double team is great. I, I love attacking players that love to create havoc on their own because what do they create for themselves? Counterattacks. And counterattacks are the number one way to score goals in futsal. The role of the first defender. Am I talking too fast, Paul? Nope. Perfect. Everybody good? I, I grew up in New York, so I talk fast. What's the role of the first defender, right? To press the point of attack, to deny balls going forward over the top or around them. The second player, okay, approach and media chase. Delay the attack, channel, tackle and block. So if young players know closest player to the ball, pressures the ball, what's the strength of my opponent, speed, foot, physicality, how do I create lines of defense behind me? Once those players then go back outdoor, oh my gosh, it's a beautiful thing to watch. Uh, selecting your style of defense. And again, the correlation from futsal to the outdoor player. So you, the coach has to understand his main objectives of the game, okay, in different situations, um, creating different styles. And we obviously know that your players dictate a lot of how the systems you're going to play, but also the coach can then adopt systems to his own players and vice versa. The strengths and weaknesses of your players is very important, as I said. And the score of the match will also dictate what style of defense you're going to play. I mean, if you're winning, you're, you could be dropping off or you could be pressuring. If you're losing, you could be pressuring most of the time. So types of defense we have, man-to-man. -man, Pretty self-explanatory. Uh, zonal systems. Players are responsible for player on their part of the court and the ball. You know, one of the big mistakes I see youth players make in defense when, when they're marking the player with the ball, when the player passes the ball to go forward, so many of our youth players, A, follow the player, or B, follow the ball. Which one do you think? Again, I repeat ball. the question. Most yeah, of our the ball. they follow the ball. Well, who's gonna who's gonna defend that player then? And in futsal, I get so many outdoor players come into the game for the first time. The player passes the ball, they follow the ball, and his player takes off. And I'm it's like, excuse me, who's gonna take your player? So within one session, quickly, we've kind of cleaned that up. We went to Costa Rica with our fourth. No, our 12s, 14s, and 16 boys and girls. This is the United States Youth Futsal International Teams. We had a session on defense the day before our first match. And all of a sudden, we're playing man-to-man, -man and they're all over the place. And I couldn't believe it. So I told the coach, blow the whistle, let's bring the kids in. So quickly, what I did is I gave the four attacking players four different color pennies black, yellow, green, whatever. And then I told the defensive players, Harold, you got black. Randy, you got blue. Paul, you got yellow. Keith, you got red. Okay, let's play. And within the first 20 seconds, they all got different colors. And I'm like, how come you all got different colors? But in a 30 minute session, we cleaned that issue up right away. That they would stay with the number. Until you get to what we call mixed defenses, and switching systems. So now if Harold, you're defending black and your player plays the ball and runs past you, and if you hear from me from behind, let him go, then you're good with it and you let him go. So once young players learn how to defend man to man, then you could add mixed defenses and you could add switching systems. We go to Montreal, I got the U14 girls. We play a team that's got wonderful physicality. We get killed six to one. We're trying to play man to man. We're going to play the same team three days later. I have a session with the kids. 
We're not going to pressure. We're going to drop back to half court and we're going to zone. In a 30 minute session, they got it. We played the same team again. We scored on a counterattack because we dropped back, went up one nothing. The other team got frustrated. They had to call a timeout. I told my team, look at you got them frustrated. We still lost, but we lost three to two and not six to one. And in one training session on a court, we cleaned the little things up. What are the advantages? Easy for players to learn, great focus and easy system. An attacker is not given a time to think, right? It's pressuring all the time. Um, what are the disadvantages? More difficult to provide cover, less teammates between lines, allows attacking players to create passing lanes and physical demanding and mentally draining. Um, normally in indoor soccer, Tom, do I still, uh, Paul, do I still have time? Yes, of course, plenty. Normally in indoor soccer, the championship series is in March. And in March is college basketball. I love March Madness, right? So I'm driving to a practice at the beginning of our best of five finals against Cleveland. And a coach is on the ESPN radio and his team is out of March Madness. And he says this, I got to do a much better job as a coach to dictate how my team is going to defend. We are a high pressure defensive team. We become predictable. We become uh, physically uh, tired and we become mentally drained. I got to learn how to mix it up so that the other team is always on the back of their heels. I'm driving to the Bradley center. Our, our thing is on ESPN. I'm like, gosh, I got to do that because the Milwaukee way was always a high pressure team. So we actually won against Cleveland because we dropped back and we pressured and we mixed it up. Uh, zonals. It's less physically demanding, allows team to use players who are weaker defensively. Opposition players are forced to think more and provide simple transitions. Disadvantage. It's difficult to teach young players zonal requires a great deal of communication. Because as you know, the six, seven, eight, nine year old is only thinking about themselves. They're not thinking about each other teammates. So zonal is, is difficult uh, to teach. So I always recommend first man to man. Um, full court, we call it tango. We just put a name to it. So when a player in the back of Fixo, who's like a sweeper, if he tells his players in front of him tango, those players understand right away they're gonna go full court. If he says tango two, they understand right away they're going to go to half court. Okay, so same thing in outdoor. You might drop to half field or you might pressure. Close defenses, a style based upon closing down space near the goal, so dropping back and protecting it. Um, outdoor soccer. Uh, consider the impact of the four closest players to the ball in outdoor in relation to pressure and cover. Pressure on the ball immediately after losing possession key, right? Creating defensive lines and cover, cutting down options and the width, eliminating penetration options. And how do you reset shift once the ball is played across the other side of the field? And that's called defensive rotations. So think about it. If four players, the one pressures the ball, the next line of defense creates cover and your last one is your deepest player. Outdoor soccer is all about little games of futsal. So as the ball gets changed all over the court, if the four closest players really know how to defend on a court and they go back outdoor, they'll be dangerous. I put some terminology together. The number five is the pivot or pivot, P-I-V-O-T. Your next players are your alas. Harold, you probably call them wingers, right? Winger. So, yeah. Okay. I, by the way, I'll throw this in, Paul. I just got done finishing the level two United States Youth Futsal online course. There is a level one online, which has been up for five months. The level two, you have to take the one before you go to two. It's about an hour and 50 minute certification course, terminology defensive systems of play, offensive, V 
videos, training sessions, animation. So please, if you're going to do more futsal, go to usyouthfutsal.com and you can take those courses. This is what we, even in the United States, we call them, right? Your fixo, your number two is your defender, your two wingers, and then your pivot up top. And we use the number system. What an outdoor two threes are your outside backs and your four and fives are inside, right? Six of your defensive midfielder, eight your attacking midfielder, seven, 11, nine, and 10. Well, in futsal, we have the same number system. Um, this is really important. It, they, this comes from basketball, is the strong side and the weak side of the court is wherever the ball is, the strong side. Wherever the ball is not, it's called the weak side. But listen to this terminology. All five players, including the goalkeeper, must be on the strong side of the court. If you take the four red players, this is a great question for you. If you take the four red players, what letter in the alphabet are you creating? Five, four, three, and two. What letter does it look like in the alphabet a little bit? An L, reverse L. It's the Y. Argentina developed the Y defense and helped them win the 2016 World Championships. And we'll talk about that in the middle. So it's divided in the two session with the midline. You have the strong side and the weak side. And the weak side has fewer defensive players because the players on the weak side offensively they're not dangerous. We talk about the funnels attacking, right? So players attacking the flanks in order to get to the second post. But what happens when they become defensively? These players now drop back into the defensive zone. So we talked about outdoor, remember? Reset happens when you lose possession getting players back behind the line of the ball, closest player to the ball becomes the first defender. Well, how do you win this? You know what Brazil says, Brazilian people say about those dotted lines? Why that funnel is so good? Because it's shaped like the Brazilian flag. They said that's where it all came. Your systems of play, 2-2, two, two, box, 1-2-1, one, one, diamond, 3-1, and the last one is the one one two, which is the wide defense. And you can have youth players play all different systems depending on who they're playing and the strengths and weaknesses of your team. The box, there's only three lines. It's kind of like introductory level. Uh, Harold, you got an academy. You teach 2-2 two -two defense? Yes, we do. We try to. We try to. It's uh... – it's, it's a little complicated with the kids because they're so used to the outside game. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's, we're working on it, definitely. Yeah. Most times you're playing either 2-2 two -two or, or your diamond defense, depending on if the other team is creating the line of three on the offense. So your defense quickly goes into the diamond defense. Mm -hmm. um, so the rotation, so when the ball gets played to a winger, one people goes and the other people drops. So you're creating cover, just like outdoor. And the back two players, your two fixos in this system, play man to man. In the diamond, you've created another line. Prevents passes to the pivot, stops passes down the line. And it's also used to defend against the flying goalkeeper. So a lot of teams, if you know hockey, they would bring the extra goalkeeper up when they're losing. So futsal started, indoor soccer then did that, and then futsal started doing it. There's, in Abakistan, a Brazilian goalkeeper, Agita, who's the best goalkeeper in the world. He comes up right at the beginning of the game, makes a save, puts the ball down, and starts attacking to create numerical advantages. Defensive rotation in this, same thing. People is responsible, pressing. Second line of defense, the alas cover, and the diamond shifts and rotates to the ball is played. 
uh, one three one. This is only done at, uh, in the half court, and you start trapping players. The wide defense, again, was created by uh, Diego Cotosi, won the World Cup for, for Argentina, now coaches El Pozo in Spain. Um, this system keeps the first line of defense with two players so that they can pressure the ball and the closest uh, player for support. So there's no easy pass when it's made. So now you've created four lines, obviously with the keeper. The number five makes the ball directional. So now the ball goes from the middle player to the winger. The four comes up, but instead of the five dropping in covers, he stays high even with the ball. The three is responsible for diagonal balls on the midline, but that's still his player on the weak side. And then number two comes to the midline to create cover, but his responsibility is still the first player that he was responsible for. What happens if the four gets beat? The three rotates over, who is the cover player. Five drops straight back, and four rotates back. So now it looks like this. So the Y formation is created again. Defending kick-ins. Your number five is responsible to first be on the ball, but we can create the Y defense right from the kick-in because the number four who would normally drop in cover behind the five, he stays high. The number three goes to the midline. The number two goes to the midline. You've created the wide defense. What options do you have there? Not many. In my FIFA conference, you know, like when you take your A license, you each get a topic, right? Is that right? Like possession in the middle third, then you got to create your own session plan. And then you sit up all night and you sweat and you're writing it down. Then you got to go out on the field and you got the national the staff there and they're grading you and you got all the coaches and they're dying, right? Uh, it's nerve wracking. Well, in my course, become a FIFA instructor. You know what my topic was? Kick-ins. I went back to my room in La Rosa and like, kick-ins, what kind of topic is that? Then I started thinking, how many kick-ins are there in a game of futsal? A lot. And where do those kick-ins come from? Middle third, defensive third, attacking third. So I figured out that kick-ins in the attacking third are more offensive in nature with some possession. Middle third, more possession with some offense, and the final third kick in or more possession. So then I had to come up with my lesson plan. But then FIFA changed the rule that instead of the ball having to be on the line, so when you go kick it, you step on the court a lot, which is illegal. They said you can take the ball off the line now. So you could actually kind of shoot from the attacking third. But now FIFA just changed the law again a couple months ago that the ball has to go back to the line. Harold, do you know this? The ball has to go back on the line, but you can step on the court. So now you can shoot. So kick-ins are really important. And, and this one is, this wide defense is great at defending it. I just went through a ton of stuff in about 10 minutes. And I'm going to send this to Paul in the PDF, and you're more than welcome to view it. But if you go to usufootsal.com, you will get a ton of stuff if you take the certification course. Questions or answers? It's interesting stuff, for sure. And it's cool to see uh, the view from the defensive side of it. You know, because you're always thinking about futsal as, as a, you know, the offensive game, the, the technical, skillful game. But that's, that's a good little view right, right there. 
you have some fun with that. <laughs> we, 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 have, we have a terminology in defense called point to your mark. Ever heard of that? So my, my girls U10 team, my daughter's team, from futsal, they have learned that when the ball goes out of bounds, you've got to point to the player that you're marking. Now, Harold, if you and I are both pointing to the same player, what does it make us do? What do we have to do? We have to communicate with each other. You're awesome. Right. First thing we got to do is, like, Harold, Harold, you're closer to him, so you take him. Oh, my God, I got a guy over here. I point to my mark. Let me tell you, in a training session of futsal, when young players point to their mark, and, and I'm not talking about they weren't around with their arms up. They just all point. We went back outdoor. I'm playing outdoor teams here in Milwaukee. My seven girls, seven girls out there, they're all pointing to their mark. The other teams are like, they're talking about butterflies and stuff. And these girls are like pointing their mark and they're closing people down. And that was a short training session that I brought to them. Something I brought from futsal to outdoor. That's amazing. Keith, you were a uh, forward from what I understand, right? Yes, I was. I was a striker until I got to the Olympic program and indoor soccer. All the, all the foreign players said, hey, go to the back, go defend. We'll score goals. <laughs> Um, it, can you talk a little bit about what the professional soccer leagues look like in America as far as futsal? I mean, sure. how does, yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a great question. There are three really organizations for futsal in the United States. There is United States Youth Futsal. That was started by Peter Vermees, the head coach of sporting, and John Perry, the technical of their academy program. I am the technical director of the United States. Within the United States Futsal, you have leagues, you have academies, you have regional and national championships. You also have youth international teams who are 10s, 12s, 14, 18 boys and girls. The state identification camps, the state identification camps go into the national identification camp, and from there, 550 kids go to Kansas City, and the youth national teams are then formed. Let me tell you, two years ago, we go to Portugal, Lisbon. Our U14 girls are going to play Benefica. Girls, they're 16s, and the 16s are their national champions. They walk into the arena, and they got the Benefica stuff on, and they look sharp. They, and they walk in there like, we're just going to kill the American girls, right? So they warm up, we warm up, blah, blah, blah. There's 2,000 people in this arena. And if you know Futsal Arena, this is not 2,000 people in a 5,000-seat like stadium. This is 2,000 people in a 1,200-seat stadium. So the atmosphere for these young girls is just unbelievable. Well, you know what happened in the first 30 seconds? We give up a goal, right? So Benfica's walking around like, yeah, yeah, yeah. 1-1, one, 2-1, one, 3-1. One, one. We went on to beat them, I think, 5-2 or 5-3. Uh, it was amazing. The physicality of the girls wore them down. But their knowledge of the game of futsal shocked Benfica because we changed from uh, low to high and high to low and different offensive systems. So it, 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 was, it was really, really – really good. So you have United States Youth Futsal. You have USFF, United States Futsal Federation, that changed their name recently to US Futsal. That's run by Alex Perra. Then you have another group that was USA Futsal, but US Futsal sued USA Futsal because it sounded too familiar. So Rob Andrews, who runs USA Futsal changed the name to United Futsal. Then you have the PFL, the professional league, which I'm the commissioner, which we haven't started yet. We brought Falcao over. We brought Ricardinho over. We sold out 
the facilities in Orlando where the NBA played at. Um, uh, Mark Cuban uh, is a partner. Donnie Nelson, president of the Dallas Mavericks. The Bus family, Jimmy Bus bought two franchises in LA. We haven't kicked off yet, but it looks like, Paul, to answer your question, we have uh, youth national teams and academies and everything. A lot of the former national team women players have called me and said, hey, by the way, the women have national teams around the world? And I said, yeah, I mean, Brazil, Costa Rica, even Iran. And they're like, well, if Iran has a national team, why doesn't the United States have a national team of futsal? I think with no disrespect that when we do have a women's national team for futsal, will quickly be one of the best in the world and will eventually be a world champion. And hopefully from there, you'll have the 21s, the 19s, the 17s on both sides, boys and girls all the way down. That's the landscape. Sounds a little bit like the outdoor game. <laughs> uh, yes, but you know what? The more people are playing futsal, the better. The better off it is. So, and to it, me, and, and it seems like I know here we have a number of people on today that are big proponents of futsal. I know Rich is there, Rich Elder. Um, you know Harold, of course. I mean, all these guys have have really been proponents of the game. I mean, I guess my my question would be, is you know what what are the ways that Houston could kind of galvanize together and collaborate with all these people that are doing the futsal and how do, you know, do we create one league? Is it one league through one of these entities or, I mean, how do we do it so that it becomes, you know, um, you know, a rich part of our culture here? I think before you start a league, which I love, I, you got to go with like Tom's philosophy. I think if we get Anson Dorrance, who's trying to put all the, futsal in all the elementary and secondary schools uh, in North Carolina. If, if think about it, if we could get a company like Bonet to sponsor goals and you have futsal education, which US Youth Futsal already has, which arms the elementary school teacher, and you could get into all the elementaries and then secondary schools in Houston, that's one big chunk of success. Then obviously, if you have academies or you have tournaments, so and so on, because I work with U.S. Youth Futsal, I'd love to see you come to U.S. Youth Futsal. But that doesn't mean you can't go to U.S. Futsal and United Futsal, but United Futsal is more tournament-based and then it is club-based, academy-based, or league-based. But I think to galvanize Houston and get elementary and secondary foots schools with Futsal, I think that would be such a huge step forward. So let's put a panel together. You got Tom, you got Paul, got all these wonderful men and, and women on this. We'll get Anson Dorrance involved. And so we try to do Houston at the same time we're trying to do North Carolina. I, I, I think we're stronger in numbers. Hey, hey, Keith. hey Coach. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, Keith, it's Rich Elder here from Houston. Um, I, I know you're going to come down for the regional show um, identification last year. Didn't end up working out. Um, I've been a proponent of futsal for a long time here in Houston. Still learning a lot myself. The pr um, presentation today was amazing, by the way. Thank you so much. Um, hear your words and also Tom and, and Paul and everybody go along. Um, for me, I'm also a PE teacher as well. And one thing I go on to Paul, what he's talking about and what you're talking about, galvanizing the community. There's a big um, – two big PE um, conferences each year in the Houston area for PE teachers across the board from elementary all the way to high school coaches. Um, the one's called Tapered. They have a national. Um, uh, Oops, looks like Rich, we're you're on, uh, you're on mute. I can't hear you. I think it's his uh, signal. But Paul, you have a you have a collaboration with uh, Houston ISD, I recall, correct? We do, and we also have one that's really interesting with KIPP schools. KIPP schools, right, right. And, and and we're working really closely with them, and I think they might be the perfect kind of starting partner 
Right. You know, to, to kind of get it going. Rich, can you hear me now? Rich, we lost you there. Go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, sorry. So as I was saying, there's a conference that's in uh, Conroe that has all the school districts come in. And, and what happens is people from different groups usually come in to promote their sport, whether it's, you know, golf or, you know, basketball or whatever um, concept it is. To me, that would be a great opportunity to maybe um, get somebody like yourself in there um, to come in and promote it to all, especially these inner city schools and the programs around here. Because to be honest with you, I've, I've done it in Tomball ISD where I teach that to the coaches here and try to teach them more about futsal and how it's another activity they can do. But for me, the, I guess the lack of familiarity um, for a lot of coaches, you know, that grew up in the, in the States, they just think it's soccer in a gym, um, which it's not. And so maybe doing something like that would help galvanize um, a lot of coaches in the area of getting them involved at the grassroots level, you know, and then the other thing, I know you guys, a lot, a lot of people talked about it as far as what's holding back Houston um, from really developing a higher level, but I know Randy touched on it and a lot of other coaches as well. I think access is the biggest thing. I've run a league since 2014 here in Houston, unaffiliated up until about a couple of years ago when I joined USYF. Um, and the biggest thing is the cost. You know, I know Houston's weather, it's really hot in the summer. And so you usually have to be indoors. And so um, the access to um, the facilities is a big thing. And also the price um, and trying to keep it down. You know, most of the leagues I've run, I've been basically at cost or breaking even and, Trying, trying to find a way where the parents in the suburban areas are comfortable playing on concrete because um, my inner city um, kids, they have no problem playing on the concrete. But to me, those are the two biggest things is just access and then maybe finding a way to get into these um, coaching conferences for PE, PE teachers in the school districts. Those are great points, Rich. You know, and, and we, we do it in CONCACAF, and I, I talked to Paul about this, is that when you go to a country and you're going to do some futsal, I think player development is crucial. So it could either be a tournament, identification camp. I think referee education is extremely important for futsal. So you can bring in referees to help teach futsal refereeing to their referees, and then equipment, and then coaching education. So if you have a package like that, and then you can go to those groups like you just talked about, Rich, instead of giving hypotheticals, you can say, look, it, we got these portable goals by this company. We got coaching education by this company. We got referee education by this company. And then we got identification or tournament or how we're going to do that for the weekend. Because when I come in and do coaching education, at the same time, there's an identification camp. I then watch the coaches coach during the game, and I can give them instant feedback right away. And the referee can give them instant feedback to the referees. And it's not like you do one every three months. You do everything in a weekend or or three or four days, and it's like a win-win. The other thing I like to see, and I talked to Anson about this, is when you do put futsal into the PE course, uh, uh, elementary and secondary, that the, G, the gym coach keeps an Excel sheet on players and say, hey, by the way, Houston, Paul, I got this 12-year-old over in the east part of Houston. He's in my gym class, and he's an exceptional player you've got to take a look at. So there's so many different things that could come in. But Rich, great point. That's, that's a great point for, for the teachers with the Excel sheet. That's definitely a win-win for, for all of the academies here in, in Houston that play futsal. Uh, the other aspect I think they were talking about, coaching education, very, very important. How do we get coaches, more coaches involved in football and, and come together versus – you know, being one against another or just combining the Houston community, the coaches, and, you know, what's best for Houston. This is what we need to do, A, B, and C, and eventually we'll, we'll end up growing and, you know, we'll, we'll make then at least, you know, we'll get, you know, one foot you know, started and then the second foot and, you know, move from there. United States Youth Futsal has five levels of education now. We have level one, which is already up online. Level two just went up January 1st. Level three is a licensed course, and that's an eight-hour course. Level four is a national course. That's a weekend course. Level five is an international course. So if Houston wanted to do a state course or a, a national course, then all they have to do is go to usyouthfutsal.com. Right. I'm actually talking to John Shiori about that too, which is awesome. I think one thing to add on to there, Harold, and also I think uh, um, uh, the guy from uh, 
uh, Collin Station, uh, I think it was Antonio, what was his name, um, also yeah. touched base on it as well. I, I think uh, the biggest thing a lot of coaches or myself I've come in um, a problem with as far as trying to push the, the culture of futsal and help it grow is, again, the lack of familiarity and the coaching education for the um, outdoor coaches that are very high-level outdoor coaches, but their, their lack of knowledge of futsal, I guess, scares them, and they don't want to give up a session um, to a futsal session to make it integrated, you know, and I know that we talked about burnout, but really, it really comes down to the nuts and bolts. I think as a group, if we have the, the clubs in the area, you know, the outdoor clubs and all these um, youth level clubs and development groups really making a futsal integrated part of the curriculum, I think that's going to be a positive step in the right direction. But the thing is, I've seen for most coaches, to be honest with you, a lot, a lot of fear of giving up um, um, a session for a futsal session. I don't know how, to, how, how we can address that. A lot of technical directors that are around my age, they don't know futsal, so they can't teach it, so they don't believe in it, and then they won't provide it. It's people like yourselves who continue to push for futsal to be involved. You're going to get more and more people involved in futsal. I told Paul, I went to Colorado with the Rapids several years ago to do their academy coaches and their teams. And I remember being in a cafeteria of the school that we're doing it at, and no disrespect, I could tell, because I do motivational talks for companies, I could feel a room, I could tell that the coach's body language was, why am I gonna spend a weekend with some futsal guy? Like really, okay? Spring forward, on Sunday, I'm sitting on a bench. Two coaches sit down next to me and they go, I wanna thank you. And I go, what do you mean? And they go, well, we weren't really believing in this at the beginning. However, we just came back from a showcase. Every one of our players play the same. Every one of our teams play the same. Now I get it where this court is like in and around the 18-yard box, and I'm excited about that. To me, I fell on the ground. And I was like, oh, my God, thank you so much. It was great. I think it's just a matter of osmosis. The more you guys are out there preaching the game, we're going to start creating – different players and I think it's great. So I've got a, I got a quick little video that's worth showing. This is actually a little group from Houston. If you don't mind me sharing it real quick, but it just shows you what's possible with like young kids. Let me share this real quick. Cause it's pretty darn fun to watch. You guys see that? Yep. Yep. Love that. Pretty cool, huh? That, I was actually there. That was in Austin. 
Uh, we, they had a tournament down there, but I went and watched them on that day. But I mean, wow, right? I know that, that again, it's like you have to, you, in my opinion, you need like programming, you know? It, it doesn't happen by itself, right? You have to have these people that believe in it, you know, kind of like Mario, right? Who got it going, he believed in it. He created a program that, that takes off. And, um, you know, I think it would just, I think the schools are just that, that area where it could really, really take off, right? Like if the PE teachers knew that this is just like playing basketball, right? And that you can you can play futsal because you got a gym. Here's what you need, right? So if you're if you guys are interested, this is what I I personally love to do. If you're interested in kind of being part of what you call it a a, a workshop, Keith, or a, a a working group, maybe. Yep. If if you're interested in being involved in a futsal working group for Houston, um, if you could either write it in the chat. Or, or let me know personally, because I think we need to move on this pretty quick. I mean, we, we need to start with the, this kind of stuff. And for me, as an outdoor coach and an outdoor developer, I am more than willing to give up a day a week in training to go do futsal. And I would do it all the way through U19 if it was up to me, right? Because I think it's that valuable. I mean, I was doing this stuff with my colleges when I was coaching in college, and it was so valuable for them and so much fun. And, it's cross training. It's such a joy. So if you're interested in kind of creating a working group, because we are, Tom and I, you know, we have been working with these school districts quite a bit. So maybe if we had some people that wanted to work together on this, we could, we could have a, a resource of staff that could maybe help these schools get going because these KIPP schools are all over, all over Houston. But you know, that might be one idea. So I think it's a great idea. Strength in numbers. Yeah, I think we got to work together for sure. We got to absolutely work together on this. And if you get a date and a time, uh, Tom, you know that Anson would come on, right? Or, or his assistant coach, Damon. Um, and, and first of all, I, I, I'll jump in real quick and say, I got to say to Tom, because I'm much older than him, how proud I am of Tom Beyer who has done a remarkable job, not only in Japan and Asia, but really around the world. I mean, obviously working with you guys. Um, I'm extremely proud of, of, of what Tom has done uh, for promoting soccer starts at home. Paul, thank you for calling me. I, I think it's just amazing to see Houston, love of the game, uh, to create different kinds of players. Um, for everybody that came onto the call, um, thank you for listening to a passionate futsal guy. Um, I, I wish you all the best. I know this, this is the start of the, of the tree that's going to grow and I wish you all the best in the, in the new year, uh, and stay uh, safe and well. Thank you, Keith. Wow. Absolute honor, honor and pleasure to have you on. So we got to have you on again next time, sometime in the future, hopefully. Well, let's, let's, Everybody, I saw Rich already sent in. He's in. Yep. And I know Harold, he'll be in. Oh, yeah. Sure everyone else went in. So if everybody can just say, you're in, then we'll come up with another date and time. Uh, I, I love outlines, what we need to do. And again, coaching education is something that you got to go to the PE guys and say, look, it, we got it. And if you can find a sponsor and say, by the way, it's free education for you. Um, equipment. First person we can reach out is, is Bonet. If you know someone else that has them, that's great. Um, the referees, you know, we got referee instructors that can come in. Sergio Cabrera did the World Cup in 2016. He lives in Miami. Um, can come in and instruct referees, which is really key. Um, but if we put bullet points down to have our next meeting, I think it'd be a huge step. And then media, social media, to get the word out. Yeah, if I could jump in and say a couple of things, Paul. First of all, thank you, Keith, for your, your kind words always. Um, you know how much that means to me. We've, been, we've known each other for so many years. Um, 
And I mean, just, just the fact that you've stuck with futsal for so many decades, I mean, the country is quite lucky uh, to have someone like you. But w w one of the other comments I wanted to make was, and Paul knows this, um, I guess if there's any silver lining in this whole COVID-19 thing, it's going to maybe be what I'm going to say. And that is, is that for the last several months, Paul and I have spent a ridiculous amount of time on Zoom calls with the educators in the Houston city made up of 17 different school districts. Um, and, and what we found was, is that, and, and, and it's always funny, you know, because there's a saying in, in, in it that says that if you're, if you're the smartest guy in the room, you're in the wrong room. Well, I can just tell you that for, for all, most of these conversations we're having with the educators, I was never the smartest guy in the room. I was brought in thinking that people were gonna learn from me, but I was secretly learning from others. Now these educators, they really showed us a lot of new things that helped us with what we're trying to do with our initiative in, in Houston. And that is, is that we cannot try to convince educators and parents to play neither soccer or futsal only on those merits alone. So what we've been able to do and what we saw from designing our program from the feedback from all the educators was, was the emphasis of ball mastery for young kids. And because what ball mastery does, it leads to, to basically the interest of the kid. What ball mastery really does is it teaches a child how to pay attention. That is perhaps one of the most important skills that a parent or a teacher can teach a young kid. And so, so we designed our curriculum to fit into the educators so that we could show the PE teachers but not just the PE teachers, we could show the regular teachers that if kids and small kids are involved in whether it's ball mastery, whether it's futsal, that we're teaching them how to pay attention, we're teaching them to be more disciplined, we're teaching them to have more focus, we're teaching them to be better thinkers, because again, I won't bore you with the whole thing, but a big part of our program is the neuroscience behind what we're doing. And that is, is that it's helping to, de to develop the brain. And whether you're learning a mental skill or a physical skill, it's the same learning concept. And all of those technical skills or those mental skills get stored in what's called the cerebellum. That's the seat of the unconscious brain. And the reason that futsal is so incredibly important is that the only way that you can really develop technical skills for children is by repetition, repeating them. Because in the neuroscience world, we have a phrase, and that is that, that nerve cells that fire together, wire together. And unless a child is paying attention while they're playing, whether it's ball master or learning an outside cut and inside, they're learning how to protect the ball, unless they're paying attention, it does not hardwire the brain. So this is the reason why all the great players grow up playing futsal, because they're constantly firing and wiring those nerve cells and they're creating those strong, a uh, 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 neural circuit. So what happens is it gets stored in the unconscious brain, which is the cerebellum, to be used later in an unconscious automated way without thinking about it. So these are, these are some of the things we need to teach the parents and the educators. What does development look like? How, wh what is it? And that's one of the biggest problems. And that's one of the biggest things that Paul and I are always talking about when we're, 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 we're setting up and we're designing our program. And we're actually, believe it or not, we're already in our third year in Houston of what we're doing, at least on our project. So futsal is just a major, major one more step. It all has to happen in tandem. It's not one is the, is the silver bullet. They all, we all have to be playing from the same sheet of music, like a symphony. And so that's just the kind of comments that I want to make. But it's, 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 it's a wonderful concept. And I think that now because we've got the interest and we have the, the trust of the schools that, um, that this, there's no better timing. So again, I'll yield my time, but those are my closing uh, uh, comments. And again, Keith, thanks a million, man. I mean, you, you're like the energizer, buddy, man, B bunny. You, you, you're everywhere all over the world and um, you, you sharing your, your knowledge and your experience with it. And I just wanna say thank you on behalf of, uh, of at least myself and what we're doing in Houston. So thanks, thank you very much for coming on. Fire and wire, love it. Yeah, that's basically what it is. And, and, and that's the whole idea is to
basically make these technical skills an unconscious process where you don't, and that's the great players. They, these are mathematical equations that are done in a millisecond. When, you, when you're playing futsal, the ball is moving such quick speed that players are able to measure the distance, the timing, the trajectory, the speed of the play because those, those neural pathways are hardwired. They've done it so many times. It, it's, it's an unconscious process. So that's why futsal is really, I mean, you're putting players under constant pressure to find solutions constantly. You can't hide in futsal. You can hide on a big pitch because the, best, the, the, the worst players don't get the ball. But in futsal, everybody's got to get the ball. So there's no hiding. That's what's great about it playing recreationally, too, because you can play with a professional player on your team. You can play with an amateur or beginner. You can play with a girl or a boy. It doesn't matter the level. Everybody can enjoy it because everybody gets time with the ball at their feet. And that's the, that's the great brilliance of futsal. God, I'd love that. It's, hey, it, it's all I don't know if you guys know, but I started a podcast called The World of Futsal. And Tom's been on the show. So if you haven't listened to any of the podcasts, go and listen to Tom talk for 40 minutes. It's awesome. Will do. Wow, that was, uh, that was really good. Is there any, any other questions, comments, anything at all before we, we go? We've gone almost two hours here, hour and 45 minutes. Um, Mario, any final words up from Minnesota? Uh, man, this has been awesome. I could sit on here all day. A um, couple things I wanted to say is, you know, thanks to uh, Paul, um, Coach Tozer, and Tom. Um, uh, what was I going to say? I had a point. Oh, coaching education. I, um, I've, I've taken the USYF Level 1. It's a great course. Um, I've, I had, I've purchased the second, the second um, volume, which I'll take this week. And also there's, a, there's another book called Soccer Powered by Futsal. I forget who who uh who's the author of that but that's another just another good resource for um Mar for anybody mario, who's new mario antonelli great yeah. book. So, thanks, great book. how tight futsal in the outdoor mario you're on top of it man <laughs> hey man I, I study this stuff as much as i can i love it i have a kid who who's played since he was five or six uh rec club and then uh, he's at the sporting kc academy now and they're still playing a ton of football so it's just a game that we love and Hopefully, uh, everyone uh, you know takes on to it, and, and we make better players. So, thank you, guys. There it is. Well, I know we got club leaders from all over here. I mean, I see Andy Smotherman from Baton Rouge and Lafayette, and you know, um, Romaine from Pearland Soccer. You know, Carlos, a whole bunch of great guys that know what they're doing as far as development. Um, I just hope that. Hope that this uh, stimulated some ideas. And again, um, I'm really interested to, to help Futsal, you know, uh, kind of continue to grow here in Houston. So if you're, if you're interested in, in uh, kind of joining this working group, you can tell how serious I am about it. You know, um, I'm very serious about Futsal in Houston. Um, and, and, and so like Randy, I'm gonna call on you, Randy. I want Randy Evans. Randy's awesome. So, I mean, if we can get everybody together and start thinking of ways, you know, especially these kids that are six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old. Yeah. I mean, wow, let's get all these young kids going, you know, get them, get them learning, understanding the philosophy of, of doing stuff at home, doing stuff on your own, doing stuff with a personal trainer, do it all right. Do all that stuff. But then, you know, if we create programs that, I mean, again, like you said, Keith, just to sum it up, the game of futsal is conducive to development in so many ways. It is, it is development, uh, these small numbers. So it would only make sense. We would be unwise if we didn't incorporate this into our year-long developmental programming. No, that's awesome. All right. Well, I have this recorded. Um, and uh, again, so much knowledge. Thank you, Keith. And uh, thanks for everybody for joining into us. Thanks, guys. Happy New Year. Thanks. 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 Happy New Year. Great to see you, Tom. Thank you. Yeah, you too, Keith. We got to catch up again soon. Thanks a lot for doing this for us. We really appreciate it. My honor. Thanks, Paul, for having us.
Thanks, Paul. All right, Thank see you. you guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys. Right. Okay, see you later. Paul, I'll Bye -bye. send the PDF to you. Okay, thanks, Keith.